So let's uh, let's get started here. It's uh, Thursday, March the twenty-first, uh, slightly after nine a.m. <coughs> we've uh, we've got a meeting really of the Marine and Environmental Resource Task Force. It's a resilience panel, and we'll be welcoming our uh, resilience uh, panel for a forum event today. The um, actually, before I get started, maybe we can uh, actually all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, as opposed to our normal meeting, as I mentioned, we will have some, uh, we do have some guests today from uh, the Florida Gulf Coast University, the Water School, as well as the uh, Naples Botanical Garden. And... Um, I will now actually turn over the moderation of the forum <laughs> to uh, Ms. Britt Patterson Weber, who is the Vice President of Education and Interpretation at the Naples Botanical Garden. And she will be here to do the moderating and uh, introductions and or self-introductions of our panel members. I think so. so, Britt, would you like to take over? All right. We can self-introduce ourselves. Okay, I was just going to say the same. Yeah, I just want to say good morning um, to everybody. And so, um, yeah, we have a presentation here. Um, I'm the VP of Education at the Garden. We've been doing a lot with um, beach education outreach, which is why um, we're here. You might be wondering why is a botanical garden here. Um, but I'll turn it over to the panel to introduce themselves, and I'll come back up for Q&A. And uh, these microphones have to be turned on, or are they automatically on? You can so you can hear me through the microphone. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here, and thanks to Murph. I will, I'm still wondering why the T is not pronounced in Murph. <laughs> Probably because it doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Anyway, um, I'm Mike Savarese. Uh, I'm a faculty member at Florida Gulf Coast University's Water School. I'm a coastal geologist, and over the last few years, I've been working closely with local communities to try to help um, deal with the kinds of problems that storminess and climate change is kind of throwing our way. Um, and I'll be uh, uh, one, of, one of the panelists today. I'm going to now have Janine introduce herself. Yeah, hi, I'm Janine Richards. I'm also a faculty member at Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, I'm a plant ecologist by training, and I've been working, I just got here to Southwest Florida uh, last January, so I'm relatively new to the area and immediately got pulled into working on beach dune restoration. Um, and I spent last summer monitoring the vegetation that was coming back naturally on the beaches, which I'll talk about a little bit. And I've been working with Chad and others at the Botanical Garden on restoration plans for beach dunes in various situations. And I'm Chad Washburn. I'm the Vice President of Conservation at Naples Botanical Garden, and my background is restoration ecology. And about six years ago, the garden started uh, doing some observations along our beaches and in this dynamic system, watching this change. And what are the plants that come back first, second, third? What are those things that are the early succession plants? And how does that plant community change over time? We looked at disturbed areas to see how they recover, and then we used that uh, to inform a couple pilot projects on uh, the city of Naples beaches in collaboration with them. And we planted those just a year before uh, Hurricane Ian hit, and uh, we saw a tremendous recovery of those plants and rebuilding of the dunes right after the storm. Um, they uh, survived that, that storm, whereas many of the other areas didn't. And uh, since then, we've just been continuing to build and grow on the restoration work that we do at the garden, so in collaboration with the university. So thank you. I also want to introduce Chris Daly, who's not physically with us at the moment. Chris is another faculty member at the Water School. He's a coastal engineer. He's teaching this morning, uh, so he's uh, in the trenches, so to speak. And he's going to join us remotely, probably at 10 o'clock, and would be available to have a conversation. And then you've met Britt. Britt's going to serve as the moderator for the conversation part of the program. So with that, let's get started. And I'll, you should all be able to see a screen in front of you. Hopefully it's viewable. I think you've all got good seats to see what's going on. Um, and of course, I'm pushing either the wrong button or, oh, there we go. All right. Anyway, uh, first, uh, let me just quickly review the purpose of this, uh, of this uh, uh, forum today. 
Uh, we are scientists by, by training, and the purpose of this is to provide you with, I would call them scientific observations, observations that have implications for management. Um, so the idea here is, uh, Ian was an unprecedented storm, but presumably there are going to be other Ians in our future. Uh, and we can learn lessons from what Ian did to Fort Myers Beach along with the other communities here in southwest Florida. So we're hoping that those lessons learned from Ian can provide this what we're calling food for managerial thought. And hopefully that food for thought will help the town council develop interventions that will help uh, build resilience for Fort Myers Beach uh, in the future. I should say that we are scientists. Um, we're not politicians. We're not uh, engineers, although Chris frankly, is an engineer, so uh, one of us is an engineer. We can provide those scientific observations, but we're not here to make decisions for you. Um, we're just here to help with an understanding of the processes that are evolved, uh, involved. So uh, with that, I also wanted to note that there are four or five of us here uh, participating in the panel today, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes that are also part of this research team. There are a lot of other professionals at the Water School. You can see their names up there. We're also collaborating with other uh, universities and institutions around the country. We have a colleague at Temple University. We're working very closely with the U.S. Geological Survey up in uh, St. Petersburg. And then we're working with um, coastal engineers and modelers bless you, at the University of Florida. And because we're faculty members and we have students and we're training the next generation of scientific professionals, we work with a lot of students and a lot of our students are doing a lot of the work helping this community as well. At the moment, I've just listed three of the ones that are currently active, but we've had students in the past and more coming in the future. Um, the way the talk will run or the, the, the form will run today, uh, we're gonna uh, hopefully talk for 30 minutes or so, just to give you some background, we want to start by contextualizing Hurricane Ian, just to give you a sense real quickly of why Ian caused such a ruckus, particularly here. And then we're going to review a collection of lessons learned as a consequence of Ian, lessons related to storm surge, lessons related to the value of dunes, and uh, lessons learned on how to use smart ecology to make those uh, dunes uh, more helpful. And uh, Janine and I are going to tag team the presentation. So I'm going to do the first, the first two, and then Janine will do the second two. And then we'll have the moderated discussion. We're hoping that the discussion is fruitful. You've got great ideas. Hopefully, let's keep in mind we want to keep on track. The purpose here is to come up with ultimately suggestions that the town council might consider for uh, improving Fort Myers's beach resilience as we move forward into the future. And uh, you should have received as you came in a, I call it a cheat sheet or a conversation starter. It's just some questions to get you thinking. You're welcome to use those questions. You're welcome to ask essentially anything you want. So, so that's where we're going. So let me start off and talk about um, the storm, just very, very briefly. Um, first off, I should say that obviously Fort Myers Beach wasn't alone in uh, withstanding the, the horrors of Hurricane Ian and all of our communities in Lee and Collier County in particular were hit hard. Um, we've basically been combining um, traditional geology, remote sensing kinds of technologies, uh, botany and, and, and coastal ecology to again make some observations as to how the coast was affected as a consequence of Ian. Here on this uh, map, you can see a bunch of uh, rectangles. Those rectangles represent areas where we're focused most heavily, but we're working throughout the two county portion of our coast. And the boxes in yellow are jurisdictions that we're working more closely with. So Fort Myers Beach is one of those, along with Sanibel, Naples, uh, and then the Park Service at Lover's Key. I don't really need to talk about Ian's biography. I mean, Ian's clearly imprinted on your brains. You probably know more about Ian than anybody else having lived through it. But I thought this image provides a good icon, icon for understanding why the surge was so horrible. And the reason why the surge was so horrible was because the eye made landfall just north of Fort Myers Beach on Cayo Costa Island, which meant there were onshore winds for the entire passage of the storm here in this community. Not only were there strong winds blowing on shore, but the storm moved forward very slowly and the storm was huge. So that provided an opportunity for lots of water to pile up and end up uh, across your island. Now this is really the first time we've experienced 
surge of this magnitude. Nothing comes close, maybe back in 1960 with the passage of Hurricane Donna. So this is an unprecedented phenomenon that uh, we all experienced, and one I would argue that emergency management um, just isn't all that familiar with. So it was a difficult storm to anticipate. The reason why we haven't had these kinds of surges in the past, frankly, is just dumb good luck because the storms have traveled in other directions. You probably remember Irma. Irma could have produced the kind of surge uh, we saw with Ian, but of course Irma uh, decided to make landfall in Marco Island and get that eye onto the m peninsula of Florida sooner than later. So this was the, the right collection of, of, of characteristics to provide uh, that intense surge. So what we're going to do as we move through the rest of the, of the presentation is we've got a number of these food for managerial thought slides. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide you with the observations, okay, and then we're going to show you a little bit of the evidence that has us thinking along those lines. This first set of managerial thoughts deals with storm surge itself. Now it turns out that we as a region are accustomed to dealing with vulnerability and resilience with respect to wind. It's always been a wind damaging storm. I, I, our first point here is that clearly we're not thinking enough about surge. The other thing is that vulnerability to surge is different than vulnerability to wind. Um, the wind field is pretty organized and you know when the storm gets close, what kind of wind speeds you're going to be dealing with. But surge is complicated by local geography and local geography. So it's wrong to think that a community like Fort Myers Beach should manage for surge the same where, same where everywhere along the jurisdiction's shoreline. Things vary from place to place. Things are spatially uh, different. So we are recommending that management strategies should be based on those differences. What parts of Fort Myers Beach are more vulnerable to surge, which ones aren't, and recognize that there are hot spots for surge and cold spots for surge. You probably know already that the Newton Park, the central part of the island, is clearly a hot spot. It was a place that was most impacted by surge, and there's a reason for that. Times Square, the region north of Newton Park, was probably the second most impacted. Other areas like the Sunset beach area to the south, less vulnerable uh, to surge. If you look at a map then of, um, of Fort Myers Beach, I always thought Fort Myers Beach looked like an archer's bow. You know, so I like to refer to it as a bow. And the center of the bow uh, there is the Newton Park region. These five rectangles represent five geomorphological regions, we're calling them, each experienced a slightly different set of impacts. Okay, And Newton Park, because it's in the center of the bow, received the greatest surge and withstood the most damage associated with surge. And that nice mirror-shaped center of that um, uh, archer's bow literally focused the surge to make the surge highest in the center of the island. If you want to see it, some data as to how the shape of the island affected surge, this table shows the height of the surge. That's the first line in this table. Uh, the HWM stands for high water marks. It tells you how high the surge was in each of those five regions, Bowditch to the north, South End to the south. All these numbers are in meters, by the way, so multiply them by three. And if you better at appreciating feet like I am than you are meters. And that gives you a sense as to how high the surge was. You can see Newton Park, seven meters of surge, 21 feet of surge, highest in the middle, and those values get lower as you move to the north and the south. Now, it's really the surge's interaction with the highest part of the landscape behind the beach, which typically for barrier islands are the dunes. Uh, there are parts of Fort Myers Beach that have dunes. There's large portions of Fort Myers Beach that lack dunes altogether. So when you compare the dune height in that second column to the surge height, it's the difference between the two that determines how vulnerable your region is, right? So you think of the, the dune as the fortress wall, okay, and, and the surge as the hordes of, of, of invaders that are trying to get over that wall. Okay, If the wall remains intact, if it's not overtopped, everything behind it is doing reasonably well. If the dune is low and the surge is high, then you've got trouble ahead. And you can see, when you look at the bottom line of this chart, uh, the difference between the surge height and the dune height, a five, almost six meter difference between the height of the landscape behind the dune and the height of the surge. So Newton Park was harmed the most by surge. 
The second uh, food for thought concerning storm surge is to recognize that storm surge actually has two flavors associated with it. The surge actually has the potential to do harm coming in. We call that flood surge. And it has the capability of doing damage going out. And we call that ebb surge. And it turns out that here in Fort Myers Beach, as well as Lover's Key and Sanibel, it was the ebb surge that created more damage than the incoming surge. So it's important for managers to recognize that they need to manage both for the incoming surge and the outgoing surge and recognize that there's ways to combat both of those phases. And again, not just wind. Surge needs to be part of what we're considering. Um, the, real briefly, um, the surge itself, very, very different. The, and I've talked to some of you beforehand. Some of you uh, lived through the surge, uh, presumably in, in both directions, incoming and outgoing, and, and rode it out here on the island. The incoming surge came in so high that the waves on top of the surge, the waves are the force implementers, if you will, that do the damage. The waves were sitting so high above the beach, above the dunes, that the waves didn't do much damage. So it's as if the surge came in unimpeded. It just came in and didn't really do much damage uh, to your coastal features. Okay. The returning surge, however, the ebb surge, the stuff coming out, came out at a much lower height Okay, and that water had to find the paths of least resistance, and it found those paths of least resistance and traveled at phenomenal velocities, so much so that those paths of least resistance became paths of erosion, and anything that was in the path of that erosional force got taken out. Okay, so a lot, as you all know, a lot of um, Fort Myers Beach was channelized from that returning surge. I'm going to show you a series of images and maps that look like what you see in the upper right that's colorful here. Those are some of the surge channels from uh, not Fort Myers Beach, but from Sanibel. Those maps are color coded. So if it's a hot color like a red, that's a high spot. If it's a cool color like a blue or a green, it's a low spot. That's what the surge channels look like caused by Ian on Sanibel. There's a photograph of that on the bottom right. And then there are two photographs, one from Sanibel and one from Lover's Key that show you what those surge channels Channels look like on the beach. Um, a, a number of these images are animated um, features. So what you're looking at here is what Times Square, uh, the south side of Times Square, looked like before Ian. So this is the digital elevation model, the topography of Times Square uh, before Ian. Again, you can see the legend in the lower left shows you the elevation. So again, red is high, um, blues are low. There's about a five meter difference in elevation between sea level and uh, the red and white areas. So this is what it looks like beforehand. Here's what it looks like afterwards. You can see the surge channels. They're missing here, and those surge channels are appearing here. If you look closely, and I'll make this point a little bit later again, a lot of the surge channels, again, formed, again, in places of least resistance. And for this part of the island, those paths of least resistance were between concrete foundations. Okay, So the passages between condominiums, for example, that had concrete pads, and the surge eroded everything out in between. So you have the capability of predicting where that surge is going to cause erosion in the future. It's how you've um, distributed um, the, uh, the buildings and the infrastructure along the coastal margin. Here it is for, for, uh, for Newton Park, the center part of the island. Here's what it looks beforehand. Here's what it looks like afterwards. Again, the surge channels are forming principally between buildings. Oops, excuse me. Uh, the third piece related to storm surge. Um, I think when rebuilding occurs, there needs to be greater thought and consideration for building resilience for surge. It seems like the engineering world, the, the architectural world, is well tuned to dealing with wind, not so much a surge. Again, none of us are architects, none of us are building engineers or design people, but at least that's what our intuition senses. There's also an opportunity to think about how you design the passageways between buildings. Okay, what do your passageways look like between foundations? Uh, and what are the best practices for managing those foundations? Um, here on Fort Myers Beach, so much construction is right up onto the beach um, that there really isn't an opportunity to move the coastal construction control line back. 
um, but maybe it's possible for new construction. And you should, I would argue, think uh, seriously about widening the space between um, uh, structures and, and the beach itself. Here are some photographs that show you the impact of the outgoing surge. The one on the left, you can see there the outgoing surge eroded the base of the foundation of this uh, condominium, and a lot of those foundations were undermined. So a small foundational concrete pad that doesn't extend out beyond the footprint of the building would be a bad thing because you're exposing that structure to greater uh, potential for undermining. The photograph on the right, I'm assuming there were some homes here. You can see the pilings left behind. These, uh, these homes here were not founded on hardened foundations, okay? So um, the storm surge chose to travel through this pathway and it eroded the sand out from underneath these homes and those homes were lost. And we see that over and over again along Fort Myers, Myers Beach's length. Homes that were not founded by some hard pad ended up getting taken out by the surge. Here's another example of that same phenomenon, a soft, easily erodible sand area between concrete padded um, uh, foundations. Um, here's uh, that same phenomenon. This is for uh, uh, a little south on Newton, um, Newton Park. Here's what it looks like beforehand. You can see the pads of the developed properties. And again, those surge channels seem to be preferentially forming between um, those structures. The last uh, piece that I'll um, report to you and then pass it over uh, to Janine is the value of seawalls. Okay, it turns out that Fort Myers Beach has a fair length of seawalls along its beach, and the seawalls did you good service. Now, seawalls are kind of taboo uh, in the beach management world, and they're taboo for a good reason. A seawall during normal conditions is a bad thing because a seawall reflects the wave energy, normal wave energy, and that erodes the beach out in front of it, so you're constantly losing your beach, okay? But under extreme events, like during these extreme storm surge events, the walls serve a great purpose. They form uh, a last line of defense, if you will. So one of the things we would ask Fort Myers Beach to consider is the concept of using hybrid dunes, okay, dunes that function like dunes during one set of occasions and function as seawalls as another. And I'll show you an image of that in a minute. Here's a picture of one of Fort Myers' beach's seawalls on the left and one of Naples' seawalls on the right. That seawall on the left was exhumed and exposed as a consequence of Ian, but it prevented any ebb surge damage from coming through this area. You can see the area out in front of the seawall was eroded, but that's easily repaired. Here is uh, this portion of uh, Newton Park where a seawall extends. I don't know if I can point to it. The seawall extends. I can't. I don't know if you can see the screen up here. Never mind. Uh, hard, hard to pick out, but a seawall covers most of that red edge all the way down for the two-thirds of the length, and then the seawall ends at the end of that two-third length. Here's what it looks like beforehand. Here's what it looks like afterwards. The area that had the seawall has erosion out in front of the seawall, but you don't see any ebb surge channelization going through um, the populated area. When you go south of the seawall, things change, and those ebb surge channels appear. Now, again, we're not advocating for any engineering design. None of us really understand engineering designs, frankly. But there are technologies out there that, that allow you to make a dune that behaves like a dune until it's no longer a dune. Uh, these geotubes are used uh, in various, uh, per for various purposes around the country. Basically, it's a, it's a tube, a hardened tube that's buried by a dune. That dune functions as a dune until the dune is eroded by a storm, and what gets le left behind is essentially a seawall that's protecting everything behind it. And once that, uh, once that tube is exposed, later on it would have to be reburied, and a new dune would have to be um, restored on top of it. Uh, but those technologies exist. So I'm going to pass it over to Janine. How did I do on time? <clears throat> Boo. We started late. <laughs> I'll go fast. <laughs> Take your time. Um, 
All right, so I'm want, I'm going to talk about plants and vegetation and the protective uh, power of plants in uh, and and really building power of plants in dunes, um, and some of the options that we have considering what Mike Mike talked about with the development leaving little space in some places uh, for a dune structure. So I want to just start talking, start out with looking at what a natural dune system would look like. So in a natural dune system, we're going to have a series of dunes separated by what we call swales, which are the valleys in between the dunes. Each successive dune is a little bit higher than the, the one in more towards the ocean in front of it. Um, and so if you think about Mike's idea of a fortress wall, this is three fortress walls in a row, right? Each one's a little bit higher than the last one. All of those plants are doing work in holding the soil in place. And also the vertical structure of the plants is reducing the energy of the waves when they come in. So this whole system is doing work um, in a natural system in reducing uh, damage from a storm surge or other event. What we've done in a lot of places along our coast is put uh, development right up to the edge of that fore dune. So we really only have space uh, in a lot of places to have maybe one dune, if that, that would function the way a natural dune system would work. We do have a few places um, where we have examples of a full uh, dune uh, system. Sanibel, there's some areas on Sanibel that are a good example of this. This is after Ian, but we even after Ian, considering the damage that Sanibel sustained, we can still see that dune uh, structure of the, the front ridge, the swale, the second ridge, another swale, the third ridge that stayed in place. A lot of the vegetation here is still in place. And if we look at Mike's digital elevation map of, of this area of Bowman's Beach on Sanibel, this is before Ian. And after Ian, there's really not very much change in terms of the elevations here. You can still see that ridge and swale structure in this dune system. Um, and there's not a lot of channelization just in a couple of spots where there were paths coming through the dune complex. Here in Fort Myers Beach, there are some places where there's not room to accommodate that kind of a complex, but there are places like Sunset Beach that have enough space that you could consider building, restoring an entire dune complex uh, on the beach space that you have. Uh, places like Newton Park, there's obviously less room to accommodate something like that. Um, but again, considering maybe consider setting back the, the coastal construction control line in the case of new construction um, for sort of future accommodation of some of these features. I just wanted to talk through how dunes function in, um, in storm events um, and particularly the protection that they provide in uh, lower intensity storm events or smaller storm events than we experienced in Ian. Um, and lower amounts of storm surge. So these are three scenarios. Uh, the top picture shows um, basically the dune functioning as that fortress wall. There's the storm surges coming in, but it's not overtopping the dune. The plants are dissipating the energy of the wave action, um, and, and the dune itself is providing structural protection for everything behind it. In the second picture, uh, a, a bit more intensity of a storm, you get a scarping effect where p part of the dune holds and part of the dune is eroded away. And that's what's in the picture. Um, if you go out uh, in Bowditch Beach Park, there you can see the example of scarping there where the vegetation was lost up until a point and there's sort of about a two foot cliff and then there's intact vegetation behind that. That's an example of scarping. Um, and then the picture C here is the overtopping of the dune, which is what happened in a lot of our areas um, in Hurricane Ian, where a lot, most or all of the vegetation was then lost during that overtopping event. 
Um, if there had been another dune behind this dune, then that the swale kind of fills in with some of the water and you get another chance for that second <laughs> dune to, to perform that protective function. The third dune, same thing. Um, and so in terms of thinking about dune restoration, as an ecologist, I'm always looking to what are the patterns that happen naturally. And then as a restoration ecologist, how can we as humans mimic those natural patterns to uh, rebuild a natural, a, an ecosystem that will function as closely to a natural ecosystem as possible. Um, so I'm going to go through some of what I've uh, learned from my research about and what's happening naturally with recolonization of the beaches by plants uh, following Hurricane Ian, um, and then think about the role of diversity of plant species and also local adaptations of plants and using local stock for propagation of replanting our beaches. Um, so really the idea here is to think like an ecosystem. Everything is connected and uh, when we understand what role the different parts of the system are all playing, then we can best uh, develop a plan for moving forward. Um, so I looked at vegetation recovery on the beaches starting last summer. I have 14 uh, one kilometer sections of beaches that I'm monitoring in different locations along the coast. The idea was to pair uh, developed beaches with nearby parks or natural protected area beaches um, so that they would have experienced similar types of impacts from Ian, but have been starting from a different point, right? So so the, the parks would have kind of an intact vegetation system, um, whereas the developed areas, it's much more uh, patchwork. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second. Um, and I'll be going out and resurveying these same beach uh, locations again this spring and summer. So if you're out on the beaches, you might see me and my students out there. You should come say hi to us. <laughs> um, so looking at what happened in Hurricane Ian in terms of vegetation, we can look at the maps before and after. So here I've got the, the vegetation edge uh, pre-Ian outlined in the orange, which is actually maybe a little bit hard to see. Sorry about that. Um, and then the red is the vegetation edge post-Ian. So we've got the pre-Ian aerial photo on the, the left, the post-Ian aerial photo on the right. And on Lover's Key, in this example, we lost about 50 feet or more on average of the, the vet in terms of where the vegetation was on the beach. So the line of vegetation moved back about 50 feet from the edge of the beach, from the coastline. Um, in uh, this is uh, the north end of this island uh, where we've got Bowditch Beach Park on the very north tip and then um, developed area to the south of that. And the orange line in this case, the, the vegetation edge pre-Ian is very jagged. So that really uh, was a patchwork of decisions that were made by those particular uh, property owners in, in house by house or or complex by complex in terms of how much vegetation that they allowed to have in front of their property versus open sand. Um, because of the patchwork nature of that, most of the vegetation is now gone or as of last summer was removed um, because that's not a continuous fortress wall, right? It's not serving its function as a dune. The vegetation is broken up. The water was coming in around all, eroding from all sides on that vegetation. Um, in Bowditch Beach Park to, to the north, there was that continuous line of vegetation. It moved back but it's still held. It had that scarping effect that I talked about, um, but there still is a good uh, chunk of vegetation that's intact there. What I saw as far as plants coming back naturally, a variety of things are coming back and a few surprises. So we saw some of our, our 
our standard classic beach dune species coming back right away. Railroad vine showed really strong recovery. Uh, the picture on to the, the inset picture on the left is a railroad vine seedling. The beaches were just covered with those last summer. Um, and I think they didn't do as well as they might have because we didn't have the rainfall that we would normally have last summer. Um, the beach sunflower came back really well. Coastal ground cherry was coming back really quickly uh, and strongly. On the other hand, I did not see, when I was surveying in May and June, I was not seeing a lot of sea oats. And that really didn't start to recover until later in the summer and into the fall. Um, so the sea oats, while we love the sea oats and it does great work for us on the beaches, it doesn't necessarily have that uh, resilience to bounce back really quickly and start offering its services right away after a storm. We also saw a lot of uh, kind of what we would consider maybe weeds, things that you would expect to see growing in roadsides, uh, things that you would call weeds if they're in your lawn. Um, but they're they're a lot of them are native. They're doing a job too. They come back really quickly, then they'll get replaced by other plants. So that was not a problem to see those out there. Um, we did see quite a few invasive species. And because of the, the open space that was opened up by Ian, um, invasive species have a chance to get a foothold at this point that could be problematic in the future. Um, certainly the beach napaka we saw uh, on some of the developed beaches uh, considerable amounts of that and then uh, there's a, a sort of a new invasive that we're seeing called Durban crowfoot which is a grass that's coming in in a lot of places too that we're trying to decide how concerned we are about it. Um, and in general, we saw a faster recovery of the plant communities and more native plant species in the parks rather than in the developed areas, which is not terribly surprising. Um, this is just a, a photo series that I think, Chad, you took these pictures, yeah, from um, in Naples following Hurricane Adalia, looking at the resilience of railroad vines. So this is right after Hurricane Adalia. This railroad vine patch got covered over by sand and salted, and all of the leaves were dead underneath the sand. Um, two weeks later, it starts popping up and growing back again. And then two weeks after that, it's pretty much back to where it was. This is an incredibly resilient species that can grow really quickly once it's established. And then it's doing its job. It's holding that sand in place. Just if I could jump in there yeah. real quick. Uh, you'll see that this is 30 days later. And those purple in the center of the screen, those are flowers. Oh, yeah. So it's I reproducing meant to point that out. Thank you. and producing seeds. So this is then putting out hard seeds that will sit in the sand and that's the seed bank for the future so if we do have a storm that takes this out it can recover quickly from those seeds so. yep um so and that and that starts to get to this point which is the value of diverse plants and how different plants function differently in an ecosystem and on our beaches so on our beaches we have a few different functions that plants can help us perform or can perform for us uh, there are these three key ones and then there are also a variety of other functions that i'm not going to talk about right now but plants can build dunes plants with a lot of vertical structure will capture blowing sand and start to actually form a dune structure themselves. Uh, plants that grow horizontally, like railroad vine, will hold sand in place once it's deposited there. So once a dune is built, railroad vine is those, those ropes across the beach that are holding that sand in place. And then um, things like our, our beach ground cherry are really fast re-sprouters, recoverers. They're going to get, they're going to come right up uh, from seed after the storm and provide some structure that's holding the sand in place while other things are getting back established that take a little bit longer like the sea oats. So having a variety of species really gives us a multifunctional complex in our dunes that performs all of these functions. Um, and to the dune building point, this is a picture series uh, from that the folks at the Botanical Garden took at one of the places that they planted uh, near Naples Pier um, that Chad talked about at the beginning. So the signpost in the picture is your reference point. This is right after Hurricane Ian. 
This is about three months later, um, where this this um, beach elder is coming back, and it, you can see the sand being captured by it. It's already starting to form a dune. And then by September, uh, there were other plants. Some of the grasses were coming up within that plant, so it was serving as what we call a nurse plant, creating a hospitable environment um, for other plants to be able to come in and colonize. And this is just another picture of the same species and its sand capturing capabilities after a really windy event. Uh, it's just it looks like it's winter right it's covered in sand um, and that sand will shake down into to the ground surface um, and really build up a dune in that location around that plant and the botanical garden has been doing some amazing work uh, that Chad can talk to a little bit more um, making sure that we have a supply of plants and a kind of a pipeline for getting plants out to areas that need them um, they, with uh, local materials, so plants that uh, have evolved in this region over long periods of time have particular adaptations to our conditions. They are the most likely to thrive here. So we want to maximize the local genetics that we're incorporating into our restoration efforts. And this really involves um, a lot of work behind the scenes of collecting local seeds, propagating those seeds and, and cuttings as well, um, and keeping uh, mother plants and seed stock um, in case of future disasters and in preparation of future disasters so that those plants can be grown out in mass quantities in the future. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Britt and we can take questions. Oh, and we've got some acknowledgments. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, um, we are waiting for Chris Daly to phone in. So I'm gonna turn, Jacob, I'm gonna turn my ringer on and uh, hopefully he'll join us. Uh, and um, Cindy was kind enough to take notes, and I hear she writes really, really fast. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, and I realized I gave out those um, conversation starters, and we don't have copies, or at least I don't have a copy <laughs> up here. If someone could pass, oh, we got one here we can share. Um, anyway, so go ahead, Brett. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I just wanted to actually just start by seeing. Um, what questions you may have, and I can repeat them into the mic since we are live streaming, um, so we can just expedite so no one has to come back up and forth. But do you want to recognize um, the time that you all took to come here today and start with your questions first? So I see you have your hand up. If you want to come up? Okay, sure. He's got one yet. Good morning. My name's Jim Matter. Hold on the fight. Oops. Shouldn't have touched that. Uh, my name's Jim Adderall. I'm the vice mayor for the town of Fort Myers Beach. Just wanted to thank you and everybody for organizing this this morning. Very helpful. I have three really quick questions, quick to ask, not so quick to answer. <laughs> but if you were redesigning uh, Newton Park, uh, the town is, is, is approaching that now along with our advisory committee, CELCAB, as to how to redesign and what to put in Newton Park, what would you do? Second of all, this scarping that you referenced at Bowditch Park is severe. How would you, can it be fixed? And if so, what's the proper way to fix it? And then lastly, tens of millions of dollars are being infused into Fort Myers Beach for beach restoration. Some of it trucked in sand, most of it dredged sand that'll be coming in the next few months. How, how would your thoughts and ideas today, how, how should they inform our beach restoration efforts? Thank you, I'll just sit down and listen. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm not sure how to how to divvy these up, but maybe can I take the first sure. stab I'll at least three? <laughs> three. You'll take number three. Um, I can't remember the numbers. Um, uh, Newton Park. Now keep in mind, we're not advocating for anything, right? This is based on a lot of informed intuition. Um, Newton Park, to me, based on my limited intuitive sense and what I know about what its vulnerability there, maybe a place like Newton Park would never be able to accommodate a dune complex like Janine had described. There just isn't the space. But maybe there's room to put in one of these hybrid dunes um, so that you've got something that functions as a seawall during an extreme event when the dune gets stripped away. Uh, one could argue that, uh, you know, maybe just a seawall uh, could do the same thing, uh, but just a seawall would probably add to your nourishment costs 
on a more frequent basis because just a seawall there would um, cause uh, uh, chronic erosion. Um, and that's a problem I'm assuming you've been dealing with as a community already because there is a, a seawall there or has been. Um, so that was the first question. The second question, you know, scarping is not a bad thing. And scarping on dunes can be naturally annealed. That cliff face, excuse me, that cliff face that Janine had described forms an abutment to the wind, and it doesn't take long for wind to collect and create an apron. Okay, so that that will repair itself, but that repair usually takes a couple of years. Those kinds of repairs can be accelerated by building an apron out in front of the scarp, where you're just placing. Um, nourishment sands uh, to create uh, an apron uh, to function as the what we call the stoss surface of a dune and then if you're vegetating it appropriately you've placed that sand and you've given that that uh, artificially repaired apron a greater foothold you're not as likely to lose it as quickly if another storm happens to hit doesn't take much of an of a of a storm wave height to damage the front of a dune. It takes a more severe storm to go over the top. Um, so, so you do have the, those capabilities. Um, that was two of the questions, right? And you had the third, or you had the third? Chad was going to take the third. Um, so just to add to the scarping question, um, well, uh, something additional that can be done there is uh, if you, you can, in an extreme event, um, like the hurricanes that we've had, lose some of the species diversity there and Janine talked about how much, how important, how valuable that species diversity is in the recovery and the resiliency of these beach dunes. And in an, in an event like that where we have scarping, and if we do lose those four dune species, it's an opportunity to not only, as, as Mike mentioned, um, re, uh, with sand, but all, including replanting, re-nourishing re the plants by adding some of those species that are lost to that area so that we, we have those species that are the, the um, colonizers, the early recovery plants that act as the nurse, as Janine showed that photo of the um, Iva imbricata or the beech elder and other things uh, recovered within that plant. Um, on the sand side of things, um, I always like to think back to the beach dunes. This is not just an environmental problem. This is a social and economic problem. And I brought some numbers along. Uh, I brought the 20 the last three years of available tourism reports for Lee County. And direct visitor spending generated over $4.1 billion in Lee County. And visitor spending supported more than 73,000 jobs. The number one thing that those visitors did when they came here was go to the beach. 50% of those visitors come to the beach. That's by far the top attraction. The second most popular attraction was 23%, uh, so more than twice as popular, and that was shopping. So <laughs> this is a, an environmental issue, but this is also a social and economic issue. And that, the comment um, from the vice mayor on the, the, the millions of dollars that we spend on sand and bringing sand in, um, my colleague Britt, I've heard her refer to beach dunes as your overdraft protection. So we have wind and wave energy that are, are taking that, those millions of dollars worth of sand and redistributing it. And as they do that, if we don't have plants in place to help trap and keep some of that sand here, that's our overdraft protection. That's what keeps the sand in place. That's what keeps these dunes in place, these protective dunes, um, and these dunes that can heal after a storm. They are resilient. A healthy dune that is biodiverse with local plant material and that is um, planted and restored appropriately, it is resilient. So in these day-to-day -day and these these unnamed storms that are causing uh, damage and we're losing millions of dollars worth of sand, we're losing our economic engine, uh, the plants can help to provide that function and help to keep these uh, 73,000 jobs that are supported by tourism um, going in this $4.1 billion in 2022 alone. So um, the sand is important, but without that, that those plants, we lose that ability to be resilient. And just kind of as a, an antidote to this, um, there was a uh, half a million dollars worth of sand that was put out in, was that Massachusetts uh, a couple weekends ago, and no plants that were planted on that. And over a weekend, they lost a half a million dollars worth of sand 
in an unnamed storm event. So sand is important, but we also need those plants to be able to provide that resiliency and keep that sand in place. Thank you. Um, just a, I, I realized I, I might have mentioned one other thing for the vice mayor about Newton Park. Um, that's an area of Fort Myers Beach that uh, we already see evidence for chronic um, ebb surge erosion. One of the things I didn't present today is the work we're doing using ground penetrating radar. So by using ground penetrating radar, we can see traces of historic channels in the subsurface, and they're clearly there in Newton Park, the Newton Park region, that central part of the of the Archer's Bow. So, I mean, um, the town council uh, should think about how to manage the developed footprint uh, behind that area. And I think that's where some of these insights about how the foundations are constructed, where are the paths of least resistance going to be, and those paths of least resistance are going to be where the erosion is going to preferentially occur. And uh, you want to you wanna, um, maybe get out in front of that. And Janine, sorry. Go ahead. Hi there, Bill Veach. Um, uh, just one observation I made is that this committee twice went through and put down um, dune plants in front of Newton Park. Both times they built up sand quite well, and then a small storm came and scoured them out. But one question I have about the uh, the hybrid dune that you mentioned: what, how does how does that would that interact with sea turtle nesting when the sea turtles will bore down into the sand? Yeah, um, that seems to be a. Uh, 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 a point of contention of, of having these hybrid dunes. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm not a sea turtle biologist. Um, I don't know I don't know how many turtles are going up onto the top of a dune and putting in nests there. Um, the geotubes are a hardened structure that has a lot of girth, right? You know, there's a large cross-sectional area of those geotubes. There are other ways to harden the core of a dune that are less intrusive if you will or obs obstructive to nesting turtles again don't i don't know anything about this but i gotta believe there's a there's an engineering solution that helps um, provide greater resilience of the dune structure in extreme events and uh, keeps uh, sea turtle sea turtles happy and nesting successfully a, a question for for engineers uh, do either of you have any no but i'd like to uh, i'd like to add on to your comment about the plants um, one of the problems that we've seen historically on beach restoration across southwest Florida and across much of Florida is we do plant primarily only sea oats and sea grapes. And those two species are more mature plant community species. Um, as as Janine, as some of these photos showed, we need the colonizing species. And quite often, those are the ones that grow very well. Their function is they grow very quickly and they start holding the sand and keeping it in place. We saw 30 days after um, Idalia, we saw the railroad vine had recovered that area, and that acts to stabilize the sand and trap windblown seeds of other species. So quite often, if uh, restoration is done and it's not done with the diversity of all of these different functional groups, the ones that trap sand, the ones that hold it in place, and the ones that recover quickly, um, we, we will lose plants. Those sea oats don't have a chance to get established. They don't have that quick recovery of the seed bank um, from, from plants that grow really quickly, produce lots of seeds, and can recover quickly after a storm. So that may have been a part of it. There's a time component to that as well. I don't know how long the storms occurred after when your planting was. Um, but it takes, the, the longer those plants are in place, the more structure they have in terms of root structure within the sand, the buildup of sand in the, in the upper parts of the plants. Um, and all of that provides uh, more resistance to, to wave action, but it takes a while, right? So when we restore, we have to wait a while before we get the full effects of that restoration. Um, and those benefits will continue to accrue over time as that the, the surface of the dune continues to accumulate sand and the root structure continues to go deeper. Um, there's actually 
the roots around the roots will actually bind the soil particles um, through fungal networks that eventually form in the sand and f and and hold the sand like stronger structure holding the sand together um, but that takes potentially years for all of that to develop after after an area gets planted do you want to come up or do you want me to repeat okay Hi, I'm Bruce Butcher. So you know down in the south end, we've started piling up sand, making a, a dune barrier. I'm not exactly sure what the parameters of the size of it are, but it's probably 10 to 15 feet wide and so high and then flat across the top. So is there a plan for planting that, that you know of? How much would it cost to do it? Uh, you know, I don't know how many miles that's gonna, going to be, but let's just assume it's several miles. Uh, what's it going to take to vegetate that? And what is the best process to do that, I guess? Chad, Chad or do you, do, you have the, do you have the skinny on that, Chad? <laughs> As he's, he's the Chad, Chad with two Ds. <laughs> trying to come up here and uh, ask a question but <laughs> we're gonna so uh yeah we we do have a plan to plan it it's our dune management plan um that is for the project area of the uh of the big renourishment project that we've just put out to bid um fema is also subsidizing the cost of that um so with the dune management plan that's going to be in our ila with the county um, where the costs are split between the state uh, the county and the town, um, and then the FEMA ha FEMA has also given us some money for uh, uh, more mature plants, which will, um, uh, as they were saying, you know, more mature plants and the time component for uh, doing vegetation to establish itself. It'll give it that that head start to. Uh... So we have the the projects out to bid right now. Hopefully, we're pumping sand by June. Um, the uh, north and right. So, yep, yep. So, uh, working with FWC and shorebird season's gotten pretty serious these days. Um, so, I, I'm thinking it's going to be after shorebird season in the September September time period C or post September. C could I add a caveat to the plant side of things? Uh, the plants act as, you know, they, they really are the, the thing that helps to protect our investment in the sand. Uh, and then they help to actually continue to build that protective dune. We're, there was a, a news story a few months ago, earlier this year. Um, nationally, we're, we're kind of in this emergency situation. And this is a, a publication from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And this is an assessment of native seeds and the capacity for their supply. This is looking at all of the disasters that we're facing as a country and where is the availability of the plant material to replant, thinking of things like the fires in Hawaii, where tens of miles, square miles need planted. Um, all of our coastal ecosystems across much of uh, the uh, southwestern portion of Florida the seed and plant material sources for this is, is not available yet. And that's something that at the Botanical Garden, um, we've been working over the last year to make that plant material available. So we have identified in collaboration with Janine and her research, we've identified about uh, 16 to 18 species that are really vital components of beach dune restoration. And we've been working with Rookery Bay to collect plant material, seeds and cuttings of that. And imagine taking 100 seeds and scaling that up over a six month to one year period to 1 million plants. That's the challenge that we face, but that's the thing that we're working towards. And we're working with some of the largest growers in the state. Um, six of these species had never been grown or sold commercially in a nursery in the state before. We didn't know how to grow those plants. How do you take 100 seeds and make 1 million plants from that? Um, so we are 
w thanks to some funding, just another acknowledgement from the Collier Community Foundation. They have uh, helped support the garden and uh, uh, garden staff and some students to figure out how to unlock that. Janine had a photo of that on the screen. Um, we're working to make those plants available. And one of the things that uh, Chad and I have discussed is how can we, we may have to start with a few species that are more widely available, like the sea oats, um, and then move towards adding more plants of this diversity that Janine mentioned, this local genetic diversity in these species. There's not going to be a magic bullet overnight where we can suddenly uh, make tens of millions of plants available. Fort Myers Beach is going to need millions of plants over time. Sanibel Island is going to need millions of plants. The state park system is going to need tens of millions of plants. Collier County is looking at 2.5 million plants. This is a this is a real challenge, and as an entire community that we we face together. So it's something that that we all want to continue to work together and uh, make this more resilient coastline. And if I could just add to that, I think that that idea of planting incrementally over a time period is not a bad way to approach restoration, even under ideal situations, because it allows you to be adaptive to what's happening to your restoration planting, right? You put in your, your first line of defense, the some, one component of the species that you want to include, you wait you know, six months or a year, you see where the gaps are, where things maybe died off or didn't do so well, um, and you add some new species in there. You add in diversity in places where there's space for it. And over time, you get the, you get all of the benefits of all of those species being present in that community. Another thing Chad and I have been talking about looking into is uh, not starting with plants, but starting with seeds. And in places where we have nurse plants present, we may be able to add seeds mm -hmm. um, and get regeneration that way, which would be a potentially cheaper uh, route to go for future restoration. Um, so this is a this is a long term process, right? And this is really it's a component of our community disaster preparedness is understanding what we do in an ideally what plan we would have in place right now so that we could move forward quickly without having these conversations the next time we have uh, a major event that we need to repair our beaches from. You know, in an ideal world, this would be something that was coordinated on a regional basis, right? Mm -hmm. There's a limited number of plants available now. It's going to take some time to make the right plants available for the entire uh, Lee and Collier County coast. Is there a way in which governments can come together and say, hey, we can wait a little while longer. The money we have can be pushed forward to the next fiscal year or some sort of cooperative uh, compromise on how those limited plants that are available now get used. And it'd be nice if those ki kinds of conversations um, could happen. First, did you have another? Yeah. So <clears throat> this plant uh, on the sea berm. Emergency berm. Emergency berm. The berm. Uh, this is a time of year that we have some conversations about water dynamics. Yeah, I, watering is a challenge. So if it can be planted at a time when they're going to receive rainfall pretty consistently for a couple months, that will help those plants to really be able to get established. And that's a that's a challenge because last summer was really dry, right. and then the winter has been a wet winter. Uh, one of the things that that uh, helps to buffer this a little bit, you know, we we don't know what the winter and summer are going to do in terms of rainfall. Uh, but as Chad mentioned, uh, planting larger plants, um, as growers, we look at this, we're, we're as much growing a root system as we are a plant. So we want a nice, healthy root system. And when you plant a tree in your yard, you plant the surface of that tree with, of the soil with relatively close to the surface of the, of the earth next to it. When you plant a beach dune plant, you actually dig down as much as six inches below 
and you'll bury that entire root ball as much as six inches deep. And the rationale for that is you're closer to, if you've been out on the beach, I go out with my kids and they dig down and you'll hit wet sand, uh, not very deep. You'll start to hit that, the moisture in the sand. So you plant them where they're closer to moisture and they can, they can quickly, their roots can reach that moisture. But also um, those plants, many of them are invigorated. Uh, Janine showed the picture of the uh, beach elder uh, covered in sand. That was a photo that I took, and I went out a couple weeks later, and that plant, when you pulled back some of that sand, it put roots out and had significant new growth. Burying a lot of these invigorates them. It's almost like adding fertilizer to them, so it makes them grow more quickly. They'll root in up the stem, and then they'll start to push really quickly. So when we plant them and plant them deep, it helps them to be closer to that water table so that they can get that water and maybe not need to be watered as much, but also to uh, invigorate them to grow more quickly. Well, I mean, the, the rainfall that's coming down will, will hit the dune surface as well. Um, if you look at if you look at the the fresh water table that's you know if you if you if you drill down uh, you'll go through a lens of fresh water that sits then on top of uh, salt water that fresh water lens will actually extend up higher underneath uh, dune fields so the berm that's out there might actually cause the top of the water table to sit a little bit higher so um, uh, I think again if if the timing of the planting is correct and there is precipitation afterwards, mm -hmm. the plants should be just fine. Uh. I need to repeat. homeowner solutions. Can you repeat that for the... Yep. So the question was um, about, is there anything we can plant this summer, such as dune sunflower, um, and what can we do as homeowners in the beach in the near future? Um, again, a lot of these plants are... are uh, not yet available, and we're working to make them more available. We're working towards the large scale uh, to get with the municipalities and get these plants out there and available. Um, there, there may be some native nurseries where you can buy some of these plants that are recommended for, um, that we're recommending for beach dunes. Uh, if I were planting, I would probably go with those uh, early colonizers that are going to grow quickly and cover your sand uh, just to try and get something that's going to prevent a lot of that sand from blowing away. They're not necessarily going to build your beach, but it's things like the railroad vine that we saw there. Uh, there's a couple other species that are those dune initiators, and they help to hold the sand in place. Yeah, I think one thing, one caution, um, if you're buying plants as a homeowner, is be aware that there are a lot of plants that have the right species name for what we want that are uh, hybrid cultivar uh, or genetics from somewhere that's very far away from here. Um, and bringing those in to our beaches does not help in the large scale picture and the long term. So if you are buying plants that you want to plant in, in your property as a homeowner, be really cautious about what the source material is. And working with a native nursery is probably going to be your best bet to get plants that are locally adapted and of the correct species and not hybrid cultivars. Um, um uh, Chad, or this is a question for one of you. <laughs> one of you two. You shared with me uh, some time ago this problem of of purchasing sea oats that are cultivated somewhere else, like in the Carolinas, mm -hmm. and and about their in inabilities or handicaps. Yeah. So so this is a relatively new uh, restoration of beach dunes, and it's a relatively localized science because your plant communities differ uh, on beach dunes, you know, across the country, and. Sea oats are a plant that grows all the way up the east coast of the United States and it remains in the Carolinas. And there's one study that says that uh, their, German, their viability of their seeds can range in some areas upwards of 80%. So 80% of the seeds that the plant produces can germinate and grow a viable plant. Uh, in other areas of the coastline, they're as low as 20% or lower. 
so um, we want to ensure that we're getting local plant material that is adapted for our area. Part of the thought in that is that the areas that have higher germination, those are areas that were hit by storms more often. And I know from the research, one of those areas was Cayo Costa that had the highest viability of sea oats. We don't want to plant sea oats that do not produce high viability of seeds uh, because over time they'll they'll hybridize with native ones that we've planted and we lose some of that ability to recover if we don't get viable seeds. There's also um, any gardeners, uh, a lot of times we have seeds that we have to, um, from a more northern cold climate, we have to cold stratify. So you put your seeds in moist conditions in your refrigerator. Uh, we don't want plants from a no more northern cold climate that we need to cold stratify because we just don't get those conditions here. And if we don't cold stratify some of those, they won't germinate. So we really want to get as local genetic material as possible. And Britt, I know you guys uh, doing the education programs, you're getting this question from a lot of uh, people in Cuyahoga County. How are you responding? Yeah, everyone is very excited to, um, they want to get going and do their own projects, which isn't helpful when we have everybody working individually. Um, and we, we've also had to stop people too from doing their own collection. So I just want to mention that we do have permits um, to do the plant collection that we've been doing um, so that we can do the propagation um, and research in the back. So, you know, I think it is really important to work with the government and not against the government or independently of um, for such a uh, such a large scale project. Um, the biggest thing, too, that we're because we're getting ready, you know, down in Collier County to see this influx of plants go in the beaches. And for the, the public side of things, the, what you can do is help protect those plants that are going in. And so we're doing the outreach with like, please don't set up your furniture uh, in the beach plants. And I know you have nesting sea turtles all up and down um, Fort Myers Beach, so that's a message that you're used to. Um, I wanted to piggyback off something that Janine said about the plant material that you're buying, um, you know, being careful about where you're getting it from. But I also urge everyone to, this is a great time to learn botanical names. Um, we do have, know of a project where they bought thousands of plants based on a common name that was shared by two different species and got thousands of the wrong species. Um, so botanical names um, from a reliable source are really important too. Mm -hmm. a, a, a 10 second wit witty anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the red hot chili peppers? You've heard of that group, yeah. Yeah, red hot chili peppers? Some friends of ours as, as a gift to their a teenage children bought them thought they were buying tickets to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and they mistakenly bought tickets for the Red Hot Chili Pipers, <laughs> which was a, 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 what do you call that? A, a bagpipe. bagpipe band. So, so the kids weren't very happy with that. So. Brilliant. <laughs> so, True story. <laughs> yeah, so um, just to address the gentleman's question uh, with regards to planting, um, uh, we're going to have a million cubic yards being put on the beach. It's going to come out in a big slurry mess. And that's been the um, consideration that the coastal engineers advised me that you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself with the plantings when they may be uh, compromised or destroyed by, by the construction project. So I'm, I'm with you. I want to get plants out there as soon as possible. Um, but we just have constraints um, that we're dealing with. But if you want to... If anyone wants to talk more about that, just feel free to give me a call. Um, okay. Just to add to that, uh, and we'll work with Chad and the team. Um, it is important. It's it's the plants are important, but there's also ways to plant them that are important. Uh, Janine mentioned uh, the different you know dune complex. Uh, there are certain plants that go on the fore dune and the back dune. One of the things that we've seen done um, by in a lot of home plantings is planting a big clump of the one species over here, another big clump of another species, planting them all together. Um, and if you have a crop failure, we saw one area where one plant had got a fungus and it Chris, killed about 5,000 plants in one area and then had a bare patch where they started getting erosion. So. Janine mentioned mimicking natural systems, so planting them in a mixed planting so that you get that. I, I just need to interrupt for a second. Chris is on the line. Do I need to do anything? or Can you, uh, Chris, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, all right, excellent. Say hello, Chris. 
Hi, everyone. <laughs> and Chris Daly. We're, Hello, Chris. We're in, we're in the discussion phase. Um, and again, Chris, uh, Chris is uh, more engineering minded, so um, he's here f uh, for the rest of the time. So thanks for being there, Chris. Sorry, go ahead, Chad, mm -hmm. or whoever was speaking. Yeah, I'm going to go with the question. So and it's a little bit different topic, if that's okay. Um, and that it is kind of up the engineering um, alley. Uh, so can you hear this, Chris? Yes, if you speak up, then I can hear the question. Okay. So my question is with regards to the retaining wall, seawall, and green uh, or hybrid uh, dune, um, and, and our dune management plan is a 10-foot wide uh, strip of vegetation that's, that's going to be planted. Um, would we want to put that 10-foot strip seaward on top of or landward of a retaining wall or seawall? The 10-foot 10, 10, uh, 10 strip of vegetation? Yeah, so the, the dune vegetation, our dune management plan, uh, the, uh, the dimensions of it are, you know, set minimum of 75% of the width of your property and then 10 feet from sea to land, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, it does. I, uh, Chris, I don't know if this uh, plays to you. Um, you know, we talked, uh, just a quick aside, we, um, and Bill, you'd asked the question about geotubes and nesting, nesting turtles. You know, if you have an existing seawall, um, you can uh, essentially create a hardened dune uh, by using an existing seawall. So you're building a dune out in front of, of the seawall. So it functions as a dune until it's gone, and then the seawall is there as a backup. Um, and then how you would vegetate that, that dune i'm not i'm not the right person to answer that part of the question i mean i i've always thought of it as think of the dune as a bank and you know the more you have in your bank the better and where you see the scours out and seaward of the seawalls you'd want your bank to have the uh as much in there as possible so that's that's just <clears throat> my thinking but i wanted to kind of reaffirm my my thoughts i think i'd want to see the situation uh, you know see see plans for it and one of the things that uh so some of the species that we promote for the four dune and being right on that front edge we actually plant at the top of the dune and they will find that because they're a little bit protected as smaller plants when they go in but as they grow they'll grow out into that four dune area um so we we they'll, they'll find that final Location. You know, I, I'm thinking I'm, I'm something I, I teach in my classes all the time, and I'm forgetting, you know, basic, you know, 101 dune science um, in terms of sedimentology. I mean, the front of the dune, that stoss surface, is really just a ramp over which sands travel when they're blown by wind. So in many ways, um, you, wanna, you want the front of the dune to have some mobility so the sand can blow up the front of the dune and then collect on the crest and then tumble down the lee surface, the backside, and so um, and plants do grow out onto the onto the stoss surface, the front of the dune. But of course, those plants are subjected to um, more frequent high tide events that might compromise their survival. So I think the front of the dunes tend to be less vegetated naturally because of that. Um, so I think yeah. if you want, if you if you want to emphasize, it, we keep looking up at this imaginary slide. It isn't there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But you think back to um, Janine's slide of the multiple functions, right? I think you want to have um, maybe the sand trappers. There we go. <laughs> the dune builders um, on the crest and on the lee surface, the backside, and maybe some sand holders. On the front side, and railroad vines typically grow out on the and front of the yeah, dune, exactly where um, they would occur and they're not—they're not so overwhelming that they're keeping every, uh, trapping every bit of sand, and the sand still has the ability to naturally move up that surface onto the crest and into the back. Uh, and, and some of the some of the planting strategies that go along with this, it it, it, it makes sense that when you plant this, anybody remember the game Plinko from Wheel of Fortune, and it, uh, uh, they they drop a <laughs> flat coin in the slot, and it the the um, if you plant your plants in rows, parallel or perpendicular to the ocean, that sand can blow right through that and not get trapped. But if you plant them in a crisscross pattern, when that sand blows through, it traps the sand. 
One of the other things we recommend is planting a little less dense on the foredune, uh, as Mike was saying. That allows the sand to blow through there and then plant more dense in the top and back of dune because that helps to trap the sand. So you, you basically create a system where you're funneling sand into an area where you have more dense plantings and it traps that sand and builds that dune. There you go. Oh, you've got the slide open. <laughs> there's, there's a thousand <laughs> slides in the back there. Great. Yeah. Uh, this is that, uh, so wider spacing on the four dune side and yep. more narrow spacing as you go back landward. And a, and a different suite of species potentially too. So we've been recommending just a few of the species for the the really front part of the dune, and then a, a greater so sea oats, railroad vine, um, and a couple of others, and then uh, quite a few more species that performed a variety of functions in that second zone that would be planted more densely. Let's let's take advantage of Chris since we have him on the phone, um, and I'm sure he's giving up something important. Um, so let's pick his brain. Um, Chris, any thoughts about? I know you and I have talked about hybrid dunes. We've talked to the Army Corps about hybrid dunes. Any insights about how you engineer um, a, a dune that um, uh, might help Fort Myers Beach? In proximity yeah, to well, a retaining wall. When we talk and, about and, and, pro and proximities to retaining walls. This idea yeah. that um, Chad mentioned about putting a dune out in front of a retaining wall. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so I think that with the hybrid dunes, it means, you know, having some hard element somewhere within that dune field. Um, so it could be in, in the middle of the dune covered by sand. It could be um, at the back of the dune exposed. Um, but... Some, some kind of structure there. Um, and you mentioned uh, geotubes or uh, some of these um, geotextile things that you can put in and that kind of keeps that sand in place and, and you know, contained, compartmentalize it. Um, and, and that really, I think that it's a good um, way because um, as I'm not sure who the gentleman was who asked the question, but he mentioned a, a very important term there, that, that sand bank, that the the dune provides, um, you know, if that gets lost during um, a surge, then <clears throat> that hard structure remains. Um, and there are many ways in which you can design that. But the important element here would be um, to think about one is the height, the crest height of, of that structure. Um, are we going to put it, you know, to, to one or two or three meters or maybe in feet that might be six or, or eight feet above um, sea level. So, so that height is important. Um, and secondly, um, I guess how the dune is structured um, in front of or around that, that hard element is important as well. Um, so you mentioned, at least I have one question for you, um, Janine or, or, or Chad. Um, one of the things that that's important for the dune here is the width right um and the gentleman had asked if a 10 foot um you know wide dune is sufficient um i would imagine that 10 feet it, it, if we think about that sand bank you know just purely stand alone um that would be perhaps the, the, the smallest amount that you would want to have um it would be better to have something that might be a bit wider, perhaps 20, 30 feet. Um, but of course, we have to think about how the dune would, would naturally grow um, as well. Um, would that 10 feet area, I mean, how many, would we still see that discernible, you know, four dune, mid dune, back dune area with 10 feet? Um, I suspect we would need um, a wider width as well um, when we consider that. So just a few things. One is the, the height of that um, hard structure, because, you know, if the sand is, if the dune is gone, that, that height is what's, you know, protecting um, the, the infrastructure behind. Um, and second is, is the question of the width. Um, I, and there are many ways in which we can play around with these two variables. I, 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 don't, I don't know why it didn't dawn on me until Chad with two Ds asked the question earlier, but um, I got to believe, and I don't know if anybody in the room knows the answer to this, um, I'm not a, 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 a sea turtle ecologist, but I would believe a, a nesting sea turtle would be supportive of a dune that sat out in front of a retaining wall. They're not going to the back of the dune. They're not yeah. going behind the dune to nest. 
So maybe that that solution, that solution for Fort Myers Beach could be more affordable because you have a lot of retaining walls that are still there. Um, yeah. And uh, you're accommodating the endangered species and their reproductive <clears throat> biology. Anyway, you, Chad was um, Chad with two Ds was going to ask another follow up question. I think. Yeah, just continue on the um, green infrastructure vein. Uh, what um, opportunities are there for uh, dunes and stormwater management, particularly in the maybe the back dune, or are there you know gray infrastructure hybrid opportunities for? stormwater management um, maybe in the dune or again in the back dune it always kind of serves as a bit of a uh, retention area where uh, water collects and percolates I know Chris when we we talked to the Army Corps about this and we talked about mm -hmm. semi permeable hardened structures so they're not impermeable walls inside of a dune or behind a wall but rather have the ability to transmit water so water can mm -hmm. flow through them. Do you have any experience with that, Chris? Um, I think that would, well, by building that that wall, I mean, you, you would make it, um, it runs continuously, right? Um, so it, it can actually create that issue of um, um, creating a pool of water on, on the inner side that you actually want to, to keep water out from. Um, what the Army Corps has done is to create these um, series of, of drainage pipes and then have um, what they recommended were, were these pumps um, that could pump away um, water that would collect behind um, the, the wall. <clears throat> um, alternatively, you have, if it's just, for example, regular day-to-day, -day, um, you know, uh, drainage, um, you know, it might rain today. You you, you don't want to avoid uh, any kind of uh, flooding on the inside. Um, then you have these uh, one-way, what you call uh, flow um, drains that you can that can be installed. And I I know that new drainage was installed recently along Fort Myers Beach. I'm not sure what type of drainage or if it includes any of these pumping or um, one-way flow features in there. So that would be a good, that's a good question to, that we might want to look into as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no. Hi, Dave Nussbaum. Thank you all for coming here. I have two questions. First one is because we have such great talent here from the university regarding plants. We have an issue with sand spurs on the south end of this island. They, uh, they kill nesting shorebirds. They also are terrible to walk on in bare feet. What can we do to, to mitigate the sand spurs on the south end of the island and in the north end. Is there anything that you could recommend to use on a beach short of going out and mechanically pulling them, which is very hard to do? And then my second question has to do with the what you refer to as the Sunset Beach. The Sunset Beach area is a beach of accretion. It's been uh, growing for the last 50 years. Uh, I'm a second generation landowner or property owner there. And when the condominium was established that I'm in, they had a hundred and I think 40 feet from the mean water, mean high water mark back to the property line. And today it's in excess of 900 feet over three football fields and it continues to grow year after year after year even after numerous storms hurricanes and we even had a tsunami that came in and it continues to grow and provide a natural barrier in your uh, mount house discussion professor you were talking about scours between the high-rise buildings and we have 10 high-rise condominiums all in a row all along that beach would it make sense because some have 
reinforced concrete seawalls, and some do not, to prevent the scouring between the buildings to try and extend that. Now, it wouldn't be town property, but it would be individual property owners to protect those properties from the scour, given the fact that we're three football fields from the mean high water mark and growing. So thank you. Two parts. You want to do spurs first? Do you have a response? I, yeah, I have a response to the sand spurs. Uh, maybe not an answer, but um, uh, this is a question that uh, our colleagues at Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve are starting to ask. On Key Waden Island, they're seeing the sand spurs, uh, more sand spurs, and that's likely due to um, it's it's a native plant. And if you've spent time on the beach, you've stepped on one for sure. Uh, <laughs> they hurt. The little uh, seed. Uh, capsule that'll really poke you and will stick to your foot or your leg, um, and you'll know it. Um, they're they're seeing issues with shorebirds there as well, and I think the proliferation of this native uh, sand spur is because of some of the damage they're seeing. More of that, we don't know if more plants of other species on the beach will outcompete those or bring them back into a lower numbers. We're not sure. Rookery Bay has uh, started asking the same question, and they're the ones that are leading research to ask what what can we do to reduce the sand spur population, and what is the true impact of it on the shorebird population. There's um, a disease or something that they're concerned about with sand spurs. I, I'm not sure. They get the, in the down of the hatch. Okay. And it's literally Sepsis, they're getting yeah. some, some issues with, within it, yeah. So um, that's a question that our colleagues at Rookery Bay are, are asking now, so. That, and that's all I can really say scientifically on that. What, what is the plant that produces What's the, uh, the the species name? The, do you know? I, I'm sorry. I, I, don't, I don't remember the scientific name off. That's okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't yeah. need to yeah. throw you under the bus. Uh -huh. um, the uh, Sunset Beach question. Did you have something? No, to go add? ahead. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to jump through a thousand slides here <laughs> um, because I do have all of the. I there's got to be a faster way to do this. Um, full disclosure. Um, we have. Um, the entire island of Fort Mars Beach, Estero Island, mapped using this LIDAR technology, both before and after. We have one segment where we're having, we've lost some critical data, and ironically, it's on that wide portion of Sunset Beach. So, you know, there's literally one empty spot on our giant map, and that empty spot is your neighborhood. Um, so anyway, um, but um, so, it's hard for me to talk about uh, how susceptible that wide beach area was uh, to channelization. I, I suspect as you move from that part of Sunset Beach further uh, south into the Sunset Beach region and then down to the south end, you, you do start to see the tapering off of the surge channelization. So maybe your part of Sunset Beach wasn't channelized that severely. That, that said, I mean, I don't know a lot about how Sunset Beach has been managed. I do know that it has accreted. It's a part, it's a progradational portion of Fort Myers Beach, which has been working towards its advantage. But I get the impression that is it is it sculpted flat to be a nice flat beach? And so, ironically, it, it, this is the same phenomenon that occurs on Markle Island in what's called Residence Beach. They've got they've got this natural and, and ironically it's in the same geological situation that your sunset beach is close to the southern termination of the island, but they plane it flat as well because everybody wants to walk across a nice clean white sand beach uh, to get to the water. Um, I would argue if there's a a place if there are two places in Southwest Florida to try to restore a dune complex like Janine had described. It's in those two places, Residence Beach and Marco, and your part of Sunset Beach. I would venture to say that if if it could if it could be cost effective, and you could uh, build uh, one or uh, more than one two beach ridges and try to reconstruct a small dune complex, you would gain all the advantages of of a, of what a seawall would do during extreme events, um, and you wouldn't suffer any of the potential disadvantages. That the seawall. The disadvantage, the disadvantage <clears throat> would be that all of those condominiums were built 30, 40, 
40, 50 years ago, and they all have ground floor units. And they don't want to. They don't want to doom There's blocking their view. Site that's interrupted on all of the ground floor units. And are the ground floor units habitable? Yes. In an Ian world. Well, we're they're all being rebuilt, but yes, they are. Yeah. They will be. Ours will be done in two months. Yeah. You know, if, if you look at the bottom of this conversation starter question list, we had two questions for you. And one was, what do people perceive as points of opposition? And I suspect, we all suspected that, you know, Dunes blocking a resident's view is going to be the single most um, um, op opposing factor for, for, for producing Dunes. The same thing happened with the Army Corps project in Collier County, the Dune building project in Collier County. I'm, I'm not sure what to say about that. I mean, to, I mean, I, I don't live on the beach. Um, maybe I'd feel differently if I did, but, I, you know, to, to, to sacrifice the dune for a view just doesn't seem very neighborly. Unless it's an additional beach grown every year for that. But surge came in there, right? I mean, the first floors were all... And in 50 years. Well, it's the first storm in 50 years that had the capability. But every storm that has that magnitude surge is probably going to do the same thing. It came in seven feet on the first floor. There wasn't a dune on the beach that would have saved it. Uh, yeah, I, it's not strictly correct. I mean, a, a, a dune of modest height, a couple of dunes of small and modest height probably would have kept the surge out, or it certainly would have reduced the surge. I'll show you. Surge came in from the basin. Rose from the basin. We saw on the base side pond. That dune on the front side was a protection. Well, I mean, that's, that's this issue of recognizing the difference between flood surge and ebb surge. You can, you know, if you have a fort that has a wall in front, and there's no wall in back, it's easy for the enemy to get in from the back. And so, again, um, communities have to think about how to manage the surge from both directions. Um, so you're right, no dune would have helped for the ebb surge. There are other ways uh, to um, increase the attenuation capacity against storm surge to prevent it from coming in. Um, mangroves are, are your best friends. There's not much mangroved um, back barrier uh, of a landscape behind Fort Myers Beach, so you're kind of handicapped by that. Um, right, and Yeah, I mean, I I would I was talking to Steve earlier. I'd love to hear some accounts of what the returning surge was like. Um, we could learn vastly from that. It, the the mangroves are very um, are very helpful as as natural infrastructure to protect against surge, but you need to have an appreciable width of of mangroves and. And that, that, I would argue, isn't a good thing. Yeah. Uh, hello, Steve Johnson, um, chair of Murph, uh, the Murph Advisory Board. It's actually a really nice segue into, into maybe my comments. Um, so I think the, the, the Fort Myers Beach really has a significant challenge in, uh, in, in maybe this reconstruction. We've got already you know, upwards of maybe $40 million of, of sand uh, that will be placed on our beach. Um, we have, uh, and most of it's on private property, uh, there is an environmental uh, erosion control line running maybe you know, the, north, the northern half to two-thirds of, of the island. So south of that, um, you know, there's no um, there's no uh, state land per se outside of uh, you know uh, uh, seaward of the of the erosion control line or the mean uh, high water line. 
So as part of our renourishment, um, you know, if I was to categorize it, we've got sand hall projects and we've got renourishment. So the sand hall projects that have come in have, uh, have placed quite a bit of sand, uh, specifically as, as uh, Bruce Butcher had mentioned on the south end of the island. Uh, there's potentially one that will occur on the north end. Uh, those come without any kind of restrictions or requirements uh, for resilience. So that sand will all be placed without any type of vegetation doing requirements. Uh, the renourishment plan is a little bit different. Uh, there we have um, a managed beach zone plan, as uh, our environmental staff had mentioned. And that requirement is that if you do sign the easement to receive the, the renourished sand, you will build a, are you required to build a, a dune 10 feet wide? Uh, I believe it's anywhere on your property, but uh, I could be wrong. Um, but it's 75% the width of your property. So there's going to be, it's not going to be a continuous, continuous dune system. Uh, it could be, you know, one might be forward, one, one potentially could be back. Um, there will be uh, people that have not uh, determined that they want the sand. And, of course, that's their personal um, uh, prerogative. But that does then open up. Uh, scour areas between the dunes so you know it's really a challenge now for for the town to how do you really armor the the beaches certainly to protect the upland uh, residents as well um, when you have you know you don't have this continuous line of dune uh, vegetated dune um, and in some cases based on the way that the slurry and the renourishment will occur uh, you may want renourishment for your property, and the two people maybe on either side of you don't, which means that they really can't renourish it because it has to be done, you know, continuously. So, and and part of this is this, uh, you know, this this uh, private property rights. One number two is these view corridors. Although I will say that the caveat is is that anything that was built on the ground, certainly from a private residence standpoint, is no longer there. So there will be elevated structures there, so there wouldn't potentially be, um, you know, a, a, a blockage to your view corridor. Uh, but again, what, you know, how, knowing that, how long could, do you, would you suggest that, that we could expect that sand, that $40 million of sand that's been placed, to actually stay there without, uh, you know, a continuous dune, without vegetation, or again, a vegetated dune, nothing, nothing, vegetated dune, 75% of the width, all the way down the island, and certainly on the south end of the island, there isn't an erosion control line, and most of those people have opted not to have any type of beach renourishment. So, um, I mean, that's that's really the challenge, I think, that the, the town faces. Um, and so any kind of, uh, you know, comments you might be able to make on, on maybe, again, the longevity of this investment, this taxpayer investment on our island, and um, and uh, again, any any other recommendations you might be able to make would be certainly appreciated. <laughs> I, 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 this this uh, maybe is just a witty retort, and, 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 and uh, this is one of those times where I'm really glad to be a scientist and not a manager. <laughs> um, you know. It, there, there's, there's no way to really answer that question. We don't. I mean, it's like it's, it's. There's, there's no way to predict with uh, any uh, significant level of confidence when that storm is going to hit and when that storm is going to have that trajectory. You know, Chad um, mentioned the, the, the half a million dollars of sand that was lost overnight. Um, the berm in Naples, they lost about a third of the berm in Naples on, uh, due to Adal uh, Dahlia, and I suspect Fort Myers Beach. By the way, we have flown um, LIDAR of, we've, we've, well, we, we will have digital elevation models for portions of Fort Myers Beach with the, do with the berm and then after Adalia and the berm. So we have an ability to sort of see how um, Adalia affected your berm. Um, you know, I, I, I guess a lot of it is just rolling the dice and hoping that, um, you know, that, um, you know, you have a good year, a, a, a lucky, a lucky string. And of course, it's not just the tropical storm season, it's the nor'easter, you know, season as well, um, you know, in, in our winter time. So, so I, I don't know that that's an answerable question. I think the fact that people have the freedom, um, uh, 
to make those decisions on, on their own and one person might want to do and another person might not, that severely complicates the matter because, you know, nature, nature doesn't, doesn't uh, recognize uh, property boundaries. And, you know, what good is a wall with a hole in it? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, water flows around holes and gaps between dunes become natural blowout areas. So those become natural areas of further weakness as you move forward. So the gap between the dunes would turn out to be potentially your most vulnerable areas as you move forward into the future. So I'm not sure. I, yeah, by all means, I, jump in. I, I'd just like to add from a mindset perspective, I, 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 this has been, uh, this, this is a really complex issue and it's forced me personally to really think about this in a lot of different ways. And we've talked a lot of a lot today about protection and that protection is vital that's something that we all need it protects our community um, it is the wall but there's also that you know i'm going back i've got my numbers up here that uh, 4.1 billion dollars of direct visitor spending in 2022 the 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 plantings even if they're sporadic and we don't get that protection if we've got those plant species out there after a storm and we lose sand those are the things that are going to spread and start trapping sand and start rebuilding our beaches and the thing that makes us resilient is that ability to recover and the plants do that they are adapted to these there was a picture um a couple away from this one of the um uh iva imbricata sorry that uh had uh I, I took a photo of during Hurricane Adai. We trapped 24 inches of sand during a hurricane where we lost a third to a half of the sand on the rest of the beach. That ability to recover quickly is part of a resiliency. So the plants are not just, and these dunes are not just the protection. They're the thing that, that you know, this economic engine, Lee County, 73,000 jobs supported by visitors to our community. Um, so I, I encourage you as you think about this to not only think about this as the protection that these beach news offer to us, but also as the um, social and economic impacts and that ability to recover. Resiliency is that ability to recover after a storm. And I'm, you were speaking to the choir. You all are incredibly resilient uh, to be here, to want to, you know, continue to move forward and be here today and do this right um, and be more resilient. Um, this is a big step in resiliency, having something that, that can heal and grow on its own after a storm. Back. He's back. Um, chat shoots again. So we have sea oats, uh, dune sunflower, a variety uh, Vestitas, um, dune panic grass, and railroad vine in our dune management plan. So uh, my question is, if you were going to recommend other species of, of dune vegetation, what would be on the top of your list? Iva Imbricata. Yeah. <laughs> Iva Imbricata beach elder uh, is a fantastic one. Uh, this is one uh, that when we do get these mounds, you can see how quickly it recovers and it traps sand. Um, Sesuvium portulacastrum. Yeah. Sea purslane is uh, another great one. Sea purslane. So uh, they're a great example of, uh, I got into all this because of my son. My son's a fisherman. He's 13 and I can't spend eight hours on the beach look with a fishing rod in my hand. So he, he fished and I turned around and looked at plants. And we've done this over years. And um, one of our favorite fishing spots was on uh, um, Keo Costa. And there's an inlet right next to the campground that went to a big uh, uh, open, essentially a lake. And over a six-month period, that inlet, um, we, we went one time and we came back and, and being instead of an inlet, it was a dune. And um, see purslane, this tiny little plant that's got tiny little half-inch leaves had started growing in that area and filled in and had built a, a two-foot-tall dune, um, initiated a dune, and, and had that channel is no longer there. Um, we have a list of species that we can provide as well, but those are two of my favorites, two of the top ones. Okay. Do you come on up? Okay. 
I want to just talk about one more experiment that the Marine Resources Task Force did back in 2013. And that's at Beach Access 22. We did a, a, a dune vegetation demonstration project. And we put the four plants that um, the Chad had pointed out. A lot of those plants are still there. They survived Ian. Um, there was a scour where there was a walking path where the plants were. A lot of those are still there and around seawalls. Um, but we put those four plants in after a few years. There wasn't any major storms that had a big washout. Uh, all that was really left was the sea oats. All the others have, have gone away. Of course, since then, my wife has planted lots of different plants. And if anybody wants to go by and look at Beach Access 22 to see dune vegetation and the different types that you can use, she's probably got two, different, two dozen different types of plants out there. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. And, and again, these are dynamic systems. And we've got now, you know, the images that we've shown, we've got a hard backstop. We've got houses and communities right there. So taking a dynamic system that has all of these plants in multiple dunes and shortening that, we're going to need to keep planting. And plants are something that we will continue to need to add to it. But it's a very small, in perpetuity, it's never going to be planted and walk away and be done. Uh, but it's a very small investment to protect uh, our uh, dunes and also to build the dunes, but also have that resiliency. So kudos, and that's a great project. Can I ask a self-serving question? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so as um, someone who works with the public and you being the public, I'm curious if there's anything, um, this was kind of the last question on that handout there. there. Was there anything in particular that resonated with you that you don't think most people know or that they should hear more about? Yes. Hi, Jennifer Rusk, uh, Marine Environmental Resource Task Force member. My question and my concern for our community, and I understand uh, people with first level condos being concerned with losing their view of the ocean. However, I'm uh, really also very concerned with the infrastructure of our streets, um, the scours that are butting up against our roadways and with um, maybe property owners that haven't um, approved that sand to be put on there or dunes, what in your, maybe your advice would be to our community to maybe entice them to do the dunes, planting, and help the upland residents? Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm going to just point at her because yeah. well, <laughs> education. Are you thinking about the Marco Island? Example, yeah. So, you know, yesterday, um, this time yesterday, we were um, at the Marco Island City Council, very similar advisory council that we were talking to, the beach advisory. And, you know, Chad had an experience um, out on Marco Island that really, um, it, it, it spoke to the power of outreach and education um, where, you know, well, Chad, why don't you talk about, like, where you were out on the beach and then what we were doing, too. But so we, had a, uh, we had a location on the beach that was uh, on the public beach that was roped off for uh, shorebirds and when the, where that was roped off all, it, it's an area that's continuously raked and where that was roped off all of a sudden all these plants started showing up and uh, the residents were concerned that they had to walk through these unsightly plants well as we looked at those plants we started it started with one particular grass but within that we started seeing some of the things that have uh, railroad vine that gets a big purple flower um, uh, dune sunflowers, some of these other more attractive plants. What they saw was the beginning of a beach dune. They were upset that they had to walk through that, but they were also in the condos. Their condo was right behind this area and was impacted. The condos next to that that are behind a, a large dune had received much less impact. Um, and they were very upset to have to walk through these plants. Well, after the conversation, we started showing them what this could look like and what it would look like when you get the railroad vine uh, uh, coming in there and you get some of these other more attractive plants and it looking like a dune and they went from being very upset that they had to walk through plants to understanding that this is something that is protective uh, for they have a they could have a huge dune complex there they could have potentially significantly reduced the impact not only to their condo but to their entire community um, and, and also had a more natural looking beach uh, so when they they first approached us they were very angry 
that they had to walk through this. And when they left, they were saying, what can we do to do more of this? And I think education really is that key. Why is this important? And, and what all does it do from the protective side, but also the resiliency side afterwards? And that's something that Britt and her team are doing. So, yeah, I mean, full knowledge is power, right? Um, but we, we've been doing a lot of programming on the beach um, and like Chad, you know, encountering angry people all the time. And, you know, to get them to turn around, it's really, there is some instruction um, that goes along with it. But with our uh, formal beach programs, we do pre and post um, evaluation with them. And, you know, pre um, education, people are unaware of any plants on the beach because you walk out to the beach, you turn your back on them, right? Um, and so when we're doing our programming and we're talking about how the ecosystem works, the function that plants play, um, what they're doing for the ecosystem um, and for us as humans who live here, um, in our post surveys, 100% of the people who come on the program are in support of plant conservation after the program, and most of the people um, are willing to share reasons why it's important, um, which indicates to us a pretty high level of learning um, if they're able to share back, you know, the, explain the reasoning behind it rather than I learned this one thing that we must do. So um, it does help. It does take time, um, but it's certainly better you know, than nothing, than doing something without, without engaging the public around it, because ultimately you need everyone's support. If I, if I might just add one, one thing to that, to Britt and Chad's comments, I think finding the right um, um, presentation um, format or to, uh, making sure you get the right audience in the room is important. Um, um, uh, I love the Mound House. I, I gave a talk at the Mound House a few weeks ago. And the people I spoke with at the Mount House kind of already knew what was going on. You know, that's a very sort of a selective audience. I think in our practices, we find that homeowners associations or condo associations bring people in with very different ilks and, and, and knowledge bases and opinions. It, it brings people in that uh, um, might be new to the problem. Uh, Faith-based communities talking with church groups, synagogue groups, we've done a lot of that. That also brings in people with all kinds of background. They're, they're coming together for another, for some other common purpose, and then, and then you have a, a diversity of thinkers in, in, in your audience. Okay. Oh, all right, there's one last question. <laughs> Walkovers, walkovers. This was the issue on Marco when that was growing through. Um, they, they're, this was growing in an area and it, it, that was roped off just for the birds for a few months. And they didn't have established walkovers for those, but estab established walkovers are important so that, um, and I don't know, do you want to, either of you want to touch on that? Sure, yeah. I actually just started a, a little experiment with my students to think about um, whether we could actually use uh, walkover material or boardwalk material that allows l some light transmission and then plant plants underneath the boardwalk to get the benefits of the plants as well as being able to have access points where there wouldn't be channelized erosion that would happen along them. Um, so that's still very preliminary right now. I don't know what the outcome of that is going to be, but we're, we're looking into yeah. some ideas like that and possible yeah. solutions. And Sanibel is uh, going to try to do some of these experiments. I, just just a, a quick aside, because this just blows my mind every time I think about it and look at it. So um, Sanibel, unlike Fort Myers Beach, has this accommodation space. It's usually got a lot of room to have uh, dune fields and dunes and ridges. And you can see here, this is uh, a, a <laughs> ridge and swale system on Sanibel Island. Sanibel, as been very conscientious about uh, restricting the way dune crossovers are engineered so they have a lot of footpaths no no raised paths but just a, a sand track that crosses uh, the dune field um, this is what it looks like uh, before Ian and this is what it looks like after Ian okay every one of those um, footpaths became an ebb surge channel and when you do the math um, there were there are 220 footpaths on the island, and 203 of them were channelized. So almost 100% of the footpaths. So a, a foresightful and well conceived strategy for for uh, engineering dune crossovers ended up working 
uh, to their disadvantage. So, so how do you how do you how do you how do you fix that? So, is the recommendation a walkover with an established berm underneath it versus a on grade footpath? I would think so. I think yeah. I, you know, um, the um, this is one of those situations where you know. It's more intuition and not thoroughly um, tested science because we haven't had a chance yet. But um, walkovers or uh, elevated crossovers are better. I would think that elevated crossovers that are higher are better, so they allow more light in from the side. Uh, maybe walkovers that are, as Janine had mentioned, are somewhat transparent, so they're transmitting light through them. Yeah, similar um, to the uh, docks that allow mm -hmm, light for exactly. right. yep. Yep. Uh, But, you know, those those kinds of solutions are expensive, presumably. Did you say railroad, the railroad vine being invasive? Um, I think I think that that definition of invasive it's uh, they're native plants and they're growing aggressively they're in an environment that's constantly shifting and they're they're uh, I wouldn't say invasive they're aggressive and they're aggressive because they're, they're in a shifting environment and they want to grow as much as they can quickly to 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 um, put as much biomass they're 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 as they grow quickly they're helping to hold sand in place and they're helping to trap other seeds blowing down the beach so well if they're they're growing into yards um I, they're 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 providing some protective function i think this is trying to did dis make this decision is you know is it is that protection is important and having that protection is important um they can be attractive uh you know if you're mowing your yard they're not going to get into your yard so it's just a a matter of making that decision if you want that there or not the tough one The question is about the zigzag. paths being a zigzag pattern rather yeah, than straight. Wanna, Go ahead. Um, yeah, and, and that's that's another treatment that Sanibel hopes to test. In other words, don't make a straight path. Put a little zig or zag in your in your pathway. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's another possibility. Um, you know, it's it's kind of odd um, when you think about this. You know, by by creating areas of weakness to cause the erosion to occur there you know those kinds of strategies could be used to avoid erosion where you don't want it in other words you know you can think about promoting um, ebb surge flow in some portions of your landscape and you want to prohibit it in others depending upon what's at risk behind it the nice thing about sanibel is all that surge erosion those footpaths um, admittedly were destroyed but the surge was contained within the dune field and the homes that were behind it were left undamaged so one could argue well maybe Sanibel's footpaths benefited them because the erosion was contained in an area um, that didn't destroy property or take take lives um, so it's it's a it, it it too is a complex problem and a complex solution So the question is, is, that the, is this a, a picture that would um, help educate people about the importance of dunes? I would. It's going through the dunes. Correct. Yes. It, the erosion didn't extend further inland onto Sanibel. I, yes. And I have borrowed this picture um, because I've seen it before in Mike's presentations, and it is it is effective with the public. If I could just go back to the railroad vine invasiveness question for a minute, I just wanted to to say that um, living alongside nature requires a little bit of compromise on our parts, and we've we've accepted that in some other situations, for example, sea turtles and some of the nesting shorebirds. We accept that there may be things that we can't do 
on our beaches to accommodate having that wildlife here, right? So I think thinking about plants and the protective services that the dunes provide, we can think about that in that same light, right? We may not get the exact same beach that we're used to having, but the beach is performing other functions that benefit us. Yeah. Well, I just thank all of you um, for all of your questions. I was not needed, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, before, before we part company, I just wanted to extend our services beyond this particular forum. The water school, uh, not only for this particular problem, but for any water-related problem, is there uh, to help you provide information and, uh, and recommendations. And I think I can say that's also true for the Naples Botanical Garden. It's not just the university. Um, and as this uh, MRF group moves forward, uh, as you're uh, trying to formulate some sort of recommendation or synth synthetic report for the, for the town, um, we're happy to help uh, further if you need clarification or again we're not we're not we we don't we won't and we don't nor do we feel comfortable um, telling communities what to do but if we can provide answers to questions to help you make those decisions then we're we're there for you Okay, I'd like to just close the meeting by thanking all the participants for coming with their uh, with their questions and their attention. We certainly like to uh, thank uh, Britt, Chad, Mike, Janine, and Chris. Chris, virtually. thank you, Chris. Uh, yep, to have this <laughs> local knowledge here and, and uh, <laughs> practical experience is, is really a benefit, and we will uh, we will come back to for for uh, for information. Uh, I'd like to thank really Amy Baker and and uh, and Jacob uh, in IT for all the help they did uh, putting yeah, everything thanks, together. Jacob. And uh, we will. Um, you thanks, know, there's just so many thanks, more questions. Cindy. And uh, the note taker, Cindy Johnson. <laughs> um, and there's just it's just really the more questions you ask, the more questions you, you generate. So there's just so much more to talk about. I think that the the town will benefit from having this discussion. It's not always an easy one, uh, as you all saw. Uh, but hopefully we'll we'll come to some 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 meaningful conclusions and and act accordingly to to do what's best really for the barrier island and the residents that uh, that live here. So thank you again. Uh, meeting adjourned. Yay. Bye, Chris.